we're podcasting, we're having fun, and uh, I'm just going to start out my show with a, a recent review that I got. Remember, I told you if you if you posted a review of my show, I would read it on air. So uh, this was Jason Graham, my good buddy. Uh, he did a review of my show. He said, this is uh, one of my almost daily go-to podcasts. Great guests, deep research, and fun info. He is accessible to fans, entertaining to listen to, and really just has a conversation with people. Love the down-to-earth vibe and the awesome guests he has. So shout out to Jason for that awesome review. Uh, make sure to check out his son's band, Yes Devil, uh, up-and-coming rock band. So great stuff. So thank you. Um, speaking of podcasts, my guests today, they have their own podcast. It's called The Parents' Lounge, and it's a fun show about them being dads, and you should check it out. So Jamie Kaler and Jason Gowan, they're here today. Jamie is a comedian and actor. Jason uh, does some acting as well and also is a paranormal investigator. And he has another day job that's really interesting that he'll get to in this episode. And this was just, this was a really fun episode for me. Uh, probably the most fun I've had in a while. Sometimes it can be stressful having two people on the show because you, you don't know who to talk to, but they made it fun for me because they're used to working together. They have good chemistry with each other. So I felt like I was, I benefited from that. So it made my job easier. And again, I just had a lot of fun and I hope you guys enjoy it too. So here we go. All right. Well, welcome Jamie Kaler and Jason Gowan. How are you guys doing? Good. Hello. It's always fun when I get two people. It's a little more of a challenge, but it's also could be more fun too. So I always find it makes it easier because then if there's only two, every time you stop talking, the yeah. other person really has to start talking. But with three, you can kind of just rest in the back and let the other two take it. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you guys could just do your podcast and I could just sit in the background and <laughs> Well, do you have kids? We, we, we just Chuck, no, do I don't. I don't have kids. No, but I, so I mean, I, we're, we're thinking about doing that, you know, at some point. And, uh, once I get my career settled and I, uh, start making money off this podcast or something, but, uh, yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm listening to some episodes of your podcasts and I feel like it's like, you get like one or two directions from people who are, have kids. They either say, Oh, it's so great. I love my kids. Or you're like, don't do it. Don't have kids. It's horrible. It'll ruin your life. And so you guys seem to be a little bit more of the, Oh my God, it's terrible. There's a lot of like fear. Well, comedy is tragedy plus time. So you need a tragedy <laughs> to get everything. Yeah. Rolling. But listen, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's awful and it's the most painful thing that's ever happened in either <laughs> of our lives. But what's the other option? Just to, you know, keep doing the same crap over and over again and just, you know, you know, it's. And then there's like a good. Yeah, there's another really like a good chance that you'll end up the creepy old guy on your street that's yelling at the kids to get off your lawn. Yeah, right. You're, just a, you're a predator at that point. My buddy, he was. Uh, I have a really good friend who was. Uh, he was really debating. Like he and his girlfriend were close, and he's like, "I just don't know if I'm ready for kids." And I said, uh, "Yeah, I get it." And he goes, "But he, but he goes. The problem is without having kids, everything else is just pointless." <laughs> I go. I go, yeah, pointless is way more fun and easy and less responsibility. But again, it's pointless. So it I, sounds know, like it, there's a lot of like high highs and low lows. Like there's those times where like the kid looks at you and like says something, you know, inspiring or like, you know, and it's just like this like teary moment, like this uh, sharing emotion. You're like, oh, the, my kid loves me. This is so magical. And then like. An hour later, you're having to clean up shit off the floor or something like that. Yeah, you just you just summed up parenthood in, in <laughs> one frame. Literally, you did. Well, yeah, except um, he said he said there's lots of high highs and oh, lots of okay. low lows, and I would argue there's lots of low lows. There are a few high highs, and the few high highs are strong enough that they get you through the twenty three and a half hours of low lows. Okay. I took my kids to school this morning and it was a pain in the ass. They were like, it was like, two, it was hours of just pain of like trying to get them to eat, to get dressed, to put sunscreen on, to brush. I, I, I had to watch her brush her teeth. She was like, bruh. I go, really? That's how you're going to brush it? We had a huge fight over brushing her teeth. Super painful to the point where I was like, what do I care? They're your teeth. I don't care if they rot out of your head. That's a you problem. <laughs> That's how the fight ended. And she's like, whatever. And I go, whatever. She's eight. And then when I dropped, you know, it was like, uh, you know, if she was a grown man, I, we probably would have gone to fisticuffs at that point. But when I finally dropped her off at school, she reached into the front seat and gave me a big hug and a kiss. And I was like, okay, all right. 
So it was 90 minutes of hell, 15 seconds of, oh, she's cool. <laughs> so the math is okay. off. The math is it, off. It, it's there somewhere. So what would make it better then? Or like if I, if I do become a parent, how do I make it? Because Jason, I think you have twins, right? So that's got to be like I, way harder. <laughs> so here's the thing. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they work. They're, I basically am raising two raptors. I mean, I, I have raptors <laughs> and, and they, and you can't take your eye off one or the other one attacks. So like they would distract you. And I feel like I'm Chris Pratt in Jurassic world. Like I got my hands up and trying to protect myself. You don't know. Like when we just had the older son, our five-year-old, we managed. Okay. But now they outnumber us. Uh, and, and unfortunately, like I've got about two months before they're going to be able to overpower me three on one. And like, I've only survived this long because I keep a, a pocket full of Teddy grams and I'll just toss them out onto the ground and they pounce on them like, like tiger. I'm totally picturing that like first scene in the first Jurassic park where the guy's like, he's hunting. And then he's like, he looks over and he's like, clever girl. And then he just gets destroyed. That's going to be you. It sounds like. That's that's I call that Tuesday. That's what I <laughs> Wow, let's see this is not a good sell on having kids. This is why I'm hesitant. This is why I've waited so long. Oh, I don't think you but should. Here, here's the thing. <laughs> the other right. thing on twins is that like if they do the dual twin hug, I I mean, I'm I am I I I cry. I I just like it's the best most a magical amazing thing in the entire world like little fairies are sprinkling pixie dust everywhere. It's amazing. And those moments though fleeting uh, are totally worth the parent like nightmare that is the rest of it. Are they worth it though? Are they, Jason? <laughs> are they worth it? Do you think on a seesaw, the scales of justice, do they equal out or is it just, I feel like it's, it's a little hellish. No, here's right. It's hellish. It's, hell it's horrible. What, who has the uh, oldest kid? Who, who's the oldest kid up between both of you? I have an eight-year-old. So that, that's that's the oldest, okay? Because that's still kind of a, a tough age. And then the teenage. I worked in the schools for seventeen years. I worked with teenagers. That's going to be really bad. Horrible. Yeah. I, so my eight-year-old has already started this thing where she just scowls at me, and she doesn't speak. I'll ask her a question, and she'll just go. And I go, "You better start talking. If you don't, I go this quiet thing. I'm not. I'm over it." You better listen to me. I'm going to take your stuff like she's playing a video game. I just rip it out of her hands and I, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. She's like totally, you know, she's got that power of just ignoring you. And you're like, dude, quit ignoring me because I'm, I'm about to. I always say that. I, I she, she laughs because I always go, I'm about to melt down, Hannah. If you don't, I'm going to lose it in about two seconds if you don't pull it together. And then uh, she finally was like, okay, dad, or whatever. So what happens if you melt down? Do you yell at her or do you? Oh, I screamed at the top of my lungs. I've scared. They told me they're scared of me somewhat because they won't do one thing I'm their mother says. Them. And I, so I talked to them and I said, hey, listen, you won't do anything your mother says, but you kind of do what I tell you. And, and the little one goes, that's because we're scared of you. And I said, good, you should be. Because honestly, I don't know what I'll do, man. It's like in Bull Durham <laughs> when the pitcher, he goes, just hit the mascot, throw the ball and hit the mascot. He goes, what are you talking about? Trust me. Because the, the guy standing in the box needs to know that there's danger ahead. And that's right. how you keep them in check. So you're the scary parent. It's, it's easy, it seems like there's either one or the other, the mom or the dad. Some people have a scarier mom than a dad. Oh, absolutely. My mother, yeah, my mother was way... My father was all bluster. He was uh, all yell and bluster, but he never touched me. My mother was the one you were scared of. Like, if my mother was vacuuming, she'd just crack you with the vacuum. She didn't care. <laughs> oh, God. The sad thing is I am the scarier parent, but I'll also hit a child with a choke slam uh, or a power bomb just randomly just to let them know I can still take them out. Wow. So like, can we talk about you guys? Like, like you're, You kind of come from humble beginnings, though, if we could just shift gears a little bit and talk about your beginnings. Because you both, like, I think, uh, Jamie, you you were you went to, uh, uh, you were like in ROTC and you were bullied and and now you're like this TV wasn't star. wasn't bullied. You said the only that people who weren't bullied were bullies, but they probably got bullied by somebody else, and that's why they became bullied. But yes, I was I was a redhead, so of course I was bullied. You weren't comfortable I, in your own skin, is what you said. I think. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've ever been comfortable. In, is anybody, com- anytime I see anyone who's that comfortable in their own skin, I'm always like, sociopath. That person's got to be a sociopath. Well, you're able to at least I fake like it. My- yeah, I, oh, I learned how to fake okay, it. Okay, that's well. what it is. Good, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what were you saying, Jason? No, I said, I look like the love child of Danny DeVito and Jack Black. So, like, I uh, absolutely got bullied. Yeah, and you had a, and you had a tough relationship with your father, right? Isn't that, I, I heard you talking about that as well. Yeah, he and he's not a fan of me so much. Uh, I was never, I was never the super jock that he wanted. Like I always wanted to do like the school play and stuff like that. And I was into superheroes, and he hated all that stuff. Uh, so there was a complex, complex dynamic there that continues even now. Well, does anybody's kid do what they want them to? Like, I tried to get my daughter to play soccer. She's like, man, I don't want to do that. I was like, oh, really? She's like, I want to. Like, they never, no, nobody's kid ever. I always love when parents are like, I want you to do this. You're like, what do you care? They're not you. It's right. Like, let them do what they want to do. But, you know, people get caught up. No, I that. know. That's what I, I say when I want to have kids. I want to, I want to raise them to be like Seahawks fans. Like, uh, like you know, other parents tell me, oh, good luck. They're going to yeah. they're gonna do whatever they want. They're going to do whatever they want. Yeah. And they already at eight. My daughter's like doing whatever she wants. It's cool. Yeah. So yeah. Can, so you, can it get to a point where we can talk about other stuff? I think I feel like it's sometimes Jason. I'm kind of done. It's so funny. Like I just dropped the kids off at school, and I'm already like we're like t- ten minutes into this time. I'm like I'm done with those kids. I'm done talking. And we were talking about my albums coming out. Like Jason and I have been doing the show for a while, and each week we really catch up on uh, on the kids. And then it was like, hey, we're doing somebody else's podcast. And then we started talking about kids again. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> well, it is interesting for me. I want to talk yeah. about, obviously, you got Star Wars poster over your shoulder. You got some Abbey Road up there. Well, yeah, you go. You guys both have really interesting careers. So, Jamie, you, you obviously, you know, we talked a little bit off air about the your IMDb credits, all your acting and stuff. So how did you get into that? Because I think you, you said you did also like over, is it 100 commercials? Oh, probably two two hundred and fifty by this time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done a lot of commercials. So, I was uh, I went to college. I went to Boston University on an ROTC scholarship. I got out. I had to serve time to pay them back. That's how I did it. But mm-hmm. no college debt, so it was kind of cool. And I had a great time. I got stationed in San Diego. I served five years, and when I got out, I didn't care. I was like, I just got a job bartending. I didn't want to do anything. Hmm. I lived on the beach in San Diego, and my friend was in an improv group, and he said, "You're pretty funny. You should come." And so I went to this improv group and I fell in love with uh, theater. And uh, Was that the one that you did at like, the back of a brewery or something? Like, with Yeah, the... we did in the back of a brewery. That sounds awesome. At, at uh, Pacific Beach Brewing Company. Kind of learned my chops there and then you know joined a theater company and started working right out of the shoot. I booked a, like the very first audition I ever went on was a SeaWorld commercial and I ended up booking it and made a ton of money. And I was hmm. like, this is the easiest job ever. And then, of course, it's not the easiest job ever. It's actually like the most competitive job that's ever happened on Earth. But, uh, you know, I would say acting is high highs and low lows. More so than like parenthood oh, okay. is some high highs, a lot of low lows. Right. But uh, acting is when you have highs. I mean, booking my boys and working with Gene Wilder on Will and & Grace. And, and some of the shows I shot were just insane and doing live comedy shows i mean jason will say the same thing about traveling and doing his shows and stuff there's nothing about getting you know when you get up in front of an audience it's just it's the drug of choice it's so great that's it amazing really is. yeah it's 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 addicting yeah so jason then your career's uh it's different you were this is fascinating to me though you're mentored by george lutz the guy who uh for people who listen to my show should know because i've had uh jeff belanger on and we've talked about Amityville Horror. He's the the dad, husband, the real guy, not the actor, or whatever from Amityville Horror. So how Correct. how did he like mentor you? I don't I don't understand. Did did he have a career in the so, paranormal or? Well, no, he so after everything happened with him and the, all of the uh, you know all the things got to be too much, and he stepped back from the public eye for like twenty five years. And when uh, just before the Ryan Reynolds movie came out, he started like going back out there and talking about his experiences and what happened. And I had something happen on a uh, routine ghost hunt uh, where I got violently pushed into a wall. And I, at that point I was done. I didn't want anything to do with ghost hunting. I I was done with the paranormal. I I was like, it's all fun and games till somebody throws a fat kid. And on that day they, they tossed me and I'm like, no, it's then this is not okay. But I had done this documentary um, 
with a company out of Seattle, and they wanted us to go to this horror movie convention to prov- pr- to like promote it. And I was like, okay, well, I'm already shopping the movie. I might as well go. And I went, and I was walking through the tables, and George Lutz happened to be there. He was going to be speaking. And I knew of the Amityville Horror. I knew of the movie. And I um, I went up to his table, and we started talking. And we got on the subject of the paranormal. I was like, well, I used to, I used to do this. And he's like, oh, well, why'd you quit? And I explained it to him. And he's like, here's the thing. You have a sense of humor. I can see that. He's like, why are you not using that to, to work with other people and help them? And I'm like, I have no idea how to do any of that. So he's like, I can teach you. And he was going back out on the road. So he offered me uh, every, I, for like three different summers, I traveled on the, on the road with him. Uh, and while well, he would do, he would do like these lectures at night, mm. but during the day he would do local cases in the area hmm. and help families. And so I, I would travel with him do, and learn all this stuff from directly from him. Wow. So you think that stuff is real? Cause I know there's like controversy that like they kind of embellish some of the stuff for the book and the movie. Um, but I think Jeff Belanger interviewed him and he was saying, no, it's a lot of that stuff was legit. It happened because that movie scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. Cause it said it was a true story. And when you're a kid, you're like, okay, that shit's going to happen to me now. <laughs> well, the beginning of it's a true story, right? Where the, I mean, like the, the murder in the house, the murder right? definitely the happened for sure. Yeah, that's correct. Oh so, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, you know, Jay Hansen, when he wrote the book, he took some liberties. He took their story and he, and he added things. Um, and the Lutz family was the first to tell you that. But there was also a lot of stuff that was way more intense than anything in the book that they never talked about publicly till the end. Really? Like what? So, like, the last night in the house, they never, like, they also, I mean, that's the other thing is that in the, in the, in the book and the movies, they leave in the middle of the night. And that's yeah. not what happened. They lasted that last night. And they intended to go back to the house. They just wanted to get it fixed and go back. Um, but the last night, um, Kathy levitated out of the bed and started going up the side of the wall. Um, and he, he couldn't move and he was trying to, to sit up, but he couldn't. And he said that at that point he sat up straight up in bed and two voices came out of him at the same time, his own voice screaming, it's in the boys room. And this weird, deep guttural wail that was behind it. Um, their dog was like spinning around in circles on the ground. It would throw up, it would stand up, it would spin around in a circle. And he, they could hear the beds upstairs slamming up, up and down. And, and the boys, they are a little more hesitant to talk about what happened that last night publicly. But, um, you know, they said that they would, they saw these hooded figures roll into the room. So there was a lot of other stuff that's not in the movies at all that was 10 times scarier than what was there. Wow. That makes me more scared. <laughs> Shit. I thought I was over that. I, I got older and I was like, it's not real. It's not real. It's just a movie. And now you're making Dude. me scared again. I mean, when do you have kids? You'll wake up at two in the morning and then she'll just be standing over you, staring at you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the kids are. That is I mean, that story's that. scary, yeah. but kids might even be more scary. But you work with paranormal no, stuff, I'm too. I, I was in both worlds. I will tell you, I have, I've been 10 times more afraid of stuff that my kids have done than the paranormal. Well, you said that uh, having a kid, this is an interesting way to put it. You said it's like the kids are suicidal. Like they're always trying to kill themselves and your job is to make sure they don't kill themselves. They're, they're always throwing themselves into the face of danger. Correct. Yeah. They have no, they don't, they, they have no like self-preservation qualities at all. They no. It's constant. They're kamikaze always. My kids are afraid of imaginary monsters under their bed, but they'll just sprint right out into traffic. They have no... Like, there's no record. Like, if two food groups touch on their plate, absolute meltdown. But if a dude in a van offers them a lollipop, they're gone. That's the end of those kids. You'll never see them again. So, oh, that's great. You know, there's no logic yeah. to how they survive. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. There's no manual. Just there is lying no, blind. No, no manual. <laughs> it, it's got to get easier with some of that stuff, though, the older they get, right? You know, it's you hope? Listen, and here's the other thing I will say, Jason and I bitch and moan and it's a Monday and we're like, you know, but, you know, I, you know, we love it. You know, we, we're, we're we, misery loves company. Yeah, I mean, that's half the fun of our show is like we get up and we tell horrible stories, but that's where the fun is, really. Like even even this morning trying to get them out. I, I mean, I, I play a curmudgeon. I think I'm almost become this character. And I think Jason has too, in a degree, even earlier, I'm thinking about the first 10 minutes of this podcast where I'm like, it's terrible. Don't have kids. 
it's almost become this self-fulfilling character I've started to play. Uh, I mean, the joke is, is like, you know, we didn't fall into this. We chose it. I chose it pretty late in life, but I... Uh, yeah, I think that's smart, though. Great, don't you? You know, they're great. I'm going, I'm going to go pick them up, and yeah. we're going swimming this. I took them to the beach yesterday. We went boogie boarding. Like, it's... Don't you think it's... it's actually pretty great. It's smart, because you say you chose, I think you were... Was it 49 or something when you... I, yeah. I, yeah. I'm, I'm 50 years older than my daughters. Yeah. So, that, that's smart, though, because I feel like once in your 20s and 30s, like... Once you start getting older, it's like, yeah, like, what else do you have left to do if you're not going to if you're going to have kids like you might as well have them a little bit later. If you have them in your 20s, then your 20s are spent raising kids. And then you, because Dude, my 30s and 40s were pretty great. I was on a right? show, my boys, for the run of my 40s. And just I had a bank full of money, ate out every night, slept every, every morning. And then I thought to myself, how can I put an end to this? <laughs> And then we had some kids, but no, it was great. It was great. I, you know, it was great, but it was, it was, it got to the point where every year was the same and all my friends were married. That's the other thing about, if you want to stay the single guy without kids or something, you, you know, have to find out. Like we even went to a barbecue at one of the other kids, parents house last night. Super, like they're all great people. It's super fun. And before that, when I was the single guy living in a rent controlled apartment at the beach, you know, I didn't get invited to anywhere. Like, mm. like the only time I ever get a call was when some dude was like, you know, he and his wife were having a huge fight. And he's like, hey, you want to go to Vegas and get fucked up? And I'm like, sure. Yeah, Tuesday, <laughs> why not? I got nothing else going. I'm a single guy living in a, yep. in, you know. But now I have one friend like that. And, you know, he, he was talking about dating recently. And he was like, oh, man, I was out on this date with this girl. And. You know, maybe 10 years ago, I would have been like, oh, really? What was that like? And now all I think of is like, that sounds horrible. Well, that's <laughs> what I, yeah. So that's one thing I, I missed out on. Having kids. Yeah, I don't have kids, but I mean, I've been in a relationship for like 10 years. So I missed out on the dating apps, like the Bumbles and the. Um, Me too. I never did. And the, uh, what's the other one called? Bumble and uh, I forgot what the. Uh, Match.com. And... No, no, no. There's like the other one that's, it's like a, bum- anyways, they have, they have these. Farmers, like, farmers only. They have all, no, but they have these apps now where you just swipe left and right. I mean, it yeah. seems like the most superficial oh, like thing. Tinder? Tinder, that's the one. Yeah. So, did you guys ever have any experience with that, or did you were you in relationships before that? I never, I never dated I, online. I had one. I had one, and I, 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 I joined a Disney dating site because we're all Disney fans, <laughs> and it got weird. Interesting. It got weird really quick because she was like, "What if I dressed up as Minnie Mouse and you let and I let you lick my toes?" I'm like, "You know what?" I no, I just said I have no no interest in in that at this time, but I have your contact info, and should I get to that point later, uh, I will give you a ring. <laughs> that is super weird. No, so oh, that reminds me. Speaking of toes, Bigfoot. Tell me about this Bigfoot documentary that you did. You were in a Bigfoot documentary. I was, yeah. So we. Why are you guy. shaking your head? What? What? Right. We, we met a guy. It was basically if Elmer Fudd and Rambo had a baby um, and he was a Bigfoot hunter. And we were like, well, we got to go out with him. I mean, he he's, he's offering to take us in the woods. He literally had a, a high powered ro- Russian, like a Soviet powered assault rifle. And he took us out of the woods. We were just teenage, like we were like 18 to 21 years old. And we're out in the woods with this guy and he is looking for Bigfoot and he's like, he was, uh, his, to give you an idea, his motto is, always save the last bullet for yourself. That's what I dealt with. Okay. So we, we got out of the woods with this guy. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, no, but, it was so an experience. This makes that this part even uh, more scary then, because you tried to, so you tried to measure your foot um, against Bigfoot's, uh, like a, a, a Bigfoot print, and did you ruin the Bigfoot print? I did. I stepped in it. I oh, said, wow. You've really done your research. Yeah. I've never had anyone do this much research. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so the guy's got a gun and was he pissed? No, no, no. Because like, if you knew the guy, you'd realize that I'm far from the first time that, that, I, that anything has gotten screwed up by him. Like, like it's kind of his call in life. Well, he besides, lives in he my could, town. Okay. He could also just make another Bigfoot print somewhere else down the road. I think oh, you think it's fake? I mean, if, 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 <laughs> So you guys don't believe in Bigfoot? I mean... I want to. I wish that he was. 
Can anybody keep a secret that good? Uh, anytime it's like it's not, nobody can keep a secret. If there if there's a Bigfoot out there, he he they'd, they'd find it. Hmm. But they are discovering new species, is, right? I mean, at the bottom of the ocean. The bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Maybe there's Bigfoot at the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. If there's a big, yeah, maybe. Well, there's all these new theories that it's like a trans-dimensional being and he just dips in and out. Like, that's kind of the, the, the trending new thing. So, like, or I guess it's not really new, but it's that's kind of like what people say it is now. So I have no idea, but do does I want he, him to be Does he real? have the Tesseract Absolutely. with him or does he, does he carry the yeah, Tesseract? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Was that the Marvel thing or something? I guess. I think it yeah, makes you, it point makes point. you go from dimension to dimension. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like that. Okay. I'm not a big Marvel guy, but I, I think I saw a picture of you with holding that. Like you have a model Jason of it or something. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Jason has his own Tesseract, I believe. I do. Yeah. I made one. Oh, you I'm made a that? Guy, so I built, I, I, yeah, I build props and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Cause I oh, saw it right. and I go, dude, that looks cool. What is it? And then I was like, oh, wait, that's from the Marvel movies. Yeah. You're a cosplay guy, but apparently you don't want to, you don't want to bang Minnie Mouse. <laughs> So what? Who would you want to bang? Oh please, Black that. Widow. He'd be all over Black, Black Widow. Widow. Okay. I did already did. Um, that might, like uh, Black Widow, Catwoman. I would have done the Invisible or like Sue Storm. Sue Storm. Any of the X Men girls. Sure, Robin. You would have done Robin. <laughs> oh no, that's DC. Never mind. That's DC. Yeah, I'm not a DC. Guy. What about the Flash? Wait, wait. so him I'm being a man has nothing to do with it. It's because he's it's because he's DC, not because he's a man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that has nothing have, to do with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have standards. Oh, oh, you guys are cracking me out. This is funny. I, I hate everything Jamie Kaler chooses to be. Uh, what? I know. That's why we get along so well. Um, it's all good, man. He's my my Marvel buddy. Yeah, that's great. No, but uh, Jamie, you do Robot Chicken. That's so I cool. Do. Are you still doing that? Is that show still on the air, or is it all? It, it actually is. I haven't done one in a while, but I anytime they uh, bring back the bloopers host, that's who I, I played the bloopers host. Now join us for more bloopers. Is that is that? I did so, like thirty episodes or something. Voiceover work has to be the best, right? You just you say you go oh. in and you twenty minutes and you're in and out. And Seth Even Green's the directing. Pandemic, I do a voice on the Loud House, and they. Uh, they just sent the equipment to my house and I did it in my closet and just set the microphone up. And I was on the computer with the guys in the booth at Nickelodeon. And they were just like, all right, say this line. You'd be like, Lisa Loud is coming in. And, uh, and they recorded the, yeah, voiceover was the best. <sighs> I had a Carnival Cruise Line campaign that was fantastic. That ran for, I was the voice of Carnival Cruise Line for like a year. And uh, I did all these commercials about, like, your vacation sucks. You know what you should do? Come on, Carnival Cruise Lines, where you're going to have a fantastic time. And then Carnival Cruise Lines had um, that little problem with the, uh, the the toilets overflowing throughout the whole ship or whatever. Remember Oops. they had, like, a shit show on the Carnival Cruise Line? I feel like there's so Dude. many cruise horror stories that I've Dude. never been on a cruise either. So, I had recorded like nine different commercials and they were all running and I was making, it was great money. And then out of nowhere that happened and it got huge news in the Gulf and everyone on got on sick on board. It was before COVID even. Mm. It was some other, like literally they had a Ebola or something on there. I don't know what happened, but so the whole campaign of like, your vacation sucks. Come on, Carnival Cruise Line. That campaign didn't work anymore. <laughs> yes. So they literally one day just stopped airing Whoops. it. And then they hired a woman. And they changed the whole campaign. And instead of me going, your vacation sucks, it was a woman who's like, hey, Carnival Cruise Line can be real fun. Don't you want to give it a try? It was a girl's voice. Uh, and they totally changed the whole that's campaign. That's totally right? different. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. But that's good. I to- had, dude, I was, I, this is crazy. I was um, Crash Bandicoot. Do you remember hmm. Crash Man? Did you ever play that game? PlayStation? Jason? I was I so, did. in the commercial campaign, I'm Crash Bandicoot. I have old spots of me. I have the little cutout face with Crash Bandicoot. And I'm like, ha ha! And I'm smashing a guy in a hospital. I did a couple spots for them. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Yeah. What? This, just before, uh, it was like 1999, maybe 2000. And so I was supposed to be, they go, campaign was killing it. And they said, uh, Hey, we're going on a 25-city international tour. Japan, London, Paris. We're going everywhere with you as Crash Bandicoot. 
I had like a like a deal for like a half a million dollars to be Crash Bandicoot and cruise around the world. It was going to be insane. And then this little thing happened called 9-11. Oh. And nobody could travel. And literally, they were like, I sent my passport info. They were booking all the flights. September 11th happened. <laughs> Bye-bye. Oh, that sucks. So it went from high, high to low, low. And I couldn't even complain about it. Yeah. Because it's 9-11 and I can't, I, you know, people were like, had suffered serious loss. And, and lost family members, and it was horrible and, and catastrophic. And then I would be like, "Yeah, I lost a job. I lost a ton of money because yeah. of nine eleven. But I couldn't. I couldn't tell anybody. You my can't complain degree. about that. Yeah, I literally lost a half, like a half a million dollars. I lost for like would have been six months of work. Wow. Yeah, that is that's shitty. But yeah, you're still alive, so that's good. I'm still alive, yeah. so I have no right to complain. No, yeah, that's true. Um. Oh, Jason, I was going to ask you about this show that you did this time next year. Expl- this sounds like really yeah, cool to yeah. me. It's like people, they, they make these extreme changes over 12 months. Um, but I couldn't find it. I only found like a, a British version. Are you in the British version? Is there two versions or what? So it, it, there were like six different versions of the show. There was a British version and Australia's version oh, okay. and American version. Uh, I was on the American version, but my episode aired more in Britain for whatever reason. So I don't, I really know. So anyway, I, I lost like 70 pounds on the show. Damn. Um, and I, and I had some health stuff. I actually proposed to my wife on the show. Oh, wow. That's really, yeah. Cause I, I saw a couple like uh, previews and it was like, dude, the stuff breaks your heart. It's like these, these kids that there was a kid without hands and like a girl without, didn't have kidney and stuff. And they're like, yeah, I'm going to get my dad's kidney or something. I'm like, oh my God, this is so, uh, terrible like it's just like heartbreaking to watch this stuff so yours is more we flew out we did like an interview with with cat dealy uh she was the host and then you you made a pledge of what you're what by this time next year i'm going to yada 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 and mine was you know i was going to lose lose a bunch of weight and trying to get into superhero shape i did lose a lot of the weight but i never gained the muscle Mm. uh but they built me like a marvel like they had a marvel costumer guy build me a costume for the show uh which i still have and then on the show i told them i'm like hey what if i propose to my wife when i come back and do the end reveal and they that's what they did they had me um come back and um uh and i proposed to melissa on the air and she said yes, obviously. <laughs> Two twins, yeah, the, the twins later, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, that show wrecked. That show wrecked your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more interested in the guy with no oh, hands. What ha- Wait, what happened with the guy with no hands? No, it was like this little girl, and she had no hands. And I just saw the pre- and then and she goes, "I'm gonna get hands." And I was like, "Oh my god, this is like so heartbreaking." And oh, like, yeah, they built they, and they built her the robotic yeah, they, prosthetic hands. I do remember her. Yeah, I never met her. She filmed a different because they would bring us in in big groups and we would oh, film okay. like sections. But some of the people we shot with, I'm I stayed friends with. Mm. So you talk about Marvel and the superhero costume. So were you? A, is it true you're an extra in, in the Dark Knight Rises? Is that right? Because I saw it on IMDb, but I didn't know if it was wow, accurate. You really? No, that's I'm so impressed. That's on IMDb. Um, yeah. Well, uh, yes, I was. I. I was a, it was a U5 line. My lines got cut, but you can still see me um, when they break out of the side of the of the jail. You, if you look on the right hand side, uh, you can see me for like an eighth of a second walk out. OK. And then, Jamie, you were in a, uh, the, the Christian Bale movie, too. The one where he's a uh, what's the one where he's Dick Cheney, right? Vice. Vice. So you guys both worked with Christian Bale, sort of like, did you guys know about the te- uh, Terminator uh, tantrum that he had before? You went on set because that would like definitely change my. Uh, I did. Oh, yeah, you did. I okay. Did know that because he had already shot that, and that he's like, "You're never gonna work again, right?" Like he loses his mind on the uh, the guy's lighting everything in this in his eye line. Well, I kind of agreed with him. I was like, "Yeah." That guy be... <laughs> and I've heard from other people who said, "Yeah, that guy won't stop lighting. He's like tinkering with lights while they're oh, shooting." Oh, really? So he yeah. was justified he to yell, for scream that. at Honestly, that guy. He's excited. He was crazy nice. Like I said, really? Okay. That's good to hear. Cause I, he is one of my favorite actors. I mean, he's one of the best who's better than Christian Bale. He is an insanely good actor because he was, 
I walked up to set. I only worked one day. In my mm-hmm. scene, I sat next to him. I play a lieutenant colonel in the war room, and I sit next to him. And he sits down. Like, he's standing. When I walked into the room, I was like, I didn't see him at all. I go, oh, he's not here. He's not here. And then I looked over, and I was like, oh, my God. And it was Christian Bale. He was Dick Cheney. I mean, he's got the shaved head. He's also a big dude. Like, he was big, and he put on all this weight, and you're like, all I could see was Batman, but he wasn't. He looked just like Dick Cheney. But isn't it a fat suit? That's, he, did he put on the weight he's himself? He's a big suit. No, he put on a ton of weight because his wow. face, everything, he did have, he was helped. Yeah. But you, he looked like Dick fucking Cheney, man. I was like, holy shit. And so he, but he, he, uh, he leaned over. He's like, and he he talked like Dick Cheney because he got the British accent. So he didn't. Huh. He spoke like Dick Cheney. He talked like that. He's like, "Hey, nice to meet you. I'm, my name's Christian." And I go, "Yeah." I know. In character, wow. In character, he did. He kept the voice. Wow. Um, he was dude. You know, when you work with people like that, and you're just to be like, I, I barely was in the movie, but mm-hmm. to be a fly on the wall in the room with him and Steve Carell was across the table from me. Carell was even more professional. Carell was not, he's not like a jokey guy. Um, they were like, hmm. it was like they were doing brain surgery. I was like, wow. even, cause I'm like always joking on set. Yeah. Work on, and these guys were like dead serious, but the f- film was super funny. And Adam McKay was even cra- crazier, better because it was, Oh, not, he's an insanely good director. Step brothers. And he, it's amazing. They had a speaker system on the state. It was a huge set. It's like this crazy set. And um, they had a war room all built. And I'm sitting at the table next to Christian Bale across from Corel. And they've already, it's the last day of filming. They'd already been working for like three months together. And I just, you know, it's really hard. Actually, I walk in and I'm like, I don't know anybody. Nobody's director. Nobody has spoken to me that this uh, AD just goes, uh, you're going to be right here. And I stand there and I'm like, okay. And so I'm standing there super nervous. I'm kind of nervous. You know, I don't want to fuck it up. And uh, out of nowhere, all of a sudden I just hear action. And I'm like, what? <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> what the fuck is happening? I'm like melting. I'm like, oh shit. And so I'm trying to remember, I only have like two lines, but I'm trying to, and they're super technical about like, I can't even remember them. Like the, uh, the air force will be coming in with, and I was so I'm in the back of my head. I'm like, what's my line again? Because normally you get to set and people talk about the scene for a second. Oh, okay. and they all We kind of run the lines once or twice. They yell action. And I'm like, holy shit. And mm. as it's getting closer, it's like a three page scene. And it's getting closer to my line. And I'm like, fuck, I'm going to be the guy out of nowhere. Because I can't remember. Yeah. And I'm like, here we go. And I'm just waiting to go. I'm out. I don't know my line. <laughs> so my heart is pounding. Oh, I'm absolutely like pounding. I'm like, oh, shit. And it gets like two lines before me. <laughs> I'm like totally panicked. And they yell, cut. And all they were doing was they were shooting the entrance where Carell walks down the hallway. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, and then God. I was totally panicked. And uh, they shot that for like four hours. I didn't say my line for like another, I don't know, six hours. Oh, <laughs> they had okay. lunch. Then they came back. You know, when you shoot, t- like I'm used to shooting TV where they shoot the whole thing in like in order okay and on a film like that they shot for 90 days they probably shot you know a page a day page mm. and a half a day that's all they shoot so they shot that thing from everywhere and adam mckay would sit there he's so talented dude it's crazy they would run the script but then he would just yell over the intercom and say say this say this and they'd riff and they'd riff and i was like wow it was crazy funny and brilliant and when you see something made of that caliber with that type of talent, you go, oh, yeah. Oh, these people are really super talented. You know, you forget uh-huh. just how talented, like, Meryl Streep, De Niro. Like, these people are, they're really good. It's pretty great to see. What like, a, I've been yeah. lucky enough to and you see got that to, in a handful of films. Yeah, and you got to work with Gene Wilder. Who else? What other times have you guys been starstruck? Gene Wilder was the one that kind that of, was the one. I was like, yeah. All Willy we, Wonka. I had a, yeah, so the first, I booked the job and I show up and it's like, I'm, I'm standing, it's like the only, I've only done a handful of sitcoms. I'm like barely acted in my life and I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, fucking Gene Wilder. And so they go, okay, let's put the scene up on its feet and we're running it and everyone else is so professional, but I can't get out of my head. I'm like, that's, that's Willy Wonka. I'm like doing a scene with, I'm like, I'm so blown away by the whole thing. 
and I suck. I, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get fired. I'm going to get fired. I had to go into the dressing room and like look in the mirror and talk to myself and be like, you got this. You can do it. Fuck that guy. He's just Gene Wilder. What do you care? <laughs> you know, I, I, I had to talk myself into it because I was like so nervous about like, holy shit, it's fucking Gene Wilder. But then as soon as you do, it's like he was like the quietest nicest guy you ever met he he had a bit in the show where he has to tear a card up will hands him a birthday card and he tears it and he's so meticulous about his craft he i saw him he what he talked to the production assistant he's like could i get a handful of cards please and they brought him a whole (laughs) stack of cards and i watched him and he practiced tearing it in different ways each card the first interesting super slowly then he, he would pick up another one and he would tear little pieces of it off one at a time, <laughs> one at a time, one at a time. Huh. And then he tore it in half, tore it twice, tore it three times. Like he went through like 10 cards. To try to figure out which one's the funniest or, yeah. What was the funniest way to tear the card? And what did he and decide If you ever watch the episode again, you'll see he chose it. He te- I forget exactly how it's he Will tears and Grace, it. It's Will and Grace, right? He tears it super slowly. Okay. And he stares at Will the whole time and he just goes, shh. <laughs> And you, I watched it. Okay. I was like, he was like this. He wasn't anything like he was on camera. He was super quiet and and demure and just interesting. Like, oh, he was the first one on set. He was the nicest guy. And uh, I like hearing those stories more than like uh, the Chevy Chase stories. You know, because I love Chevy Chase, but then you hear he's such an asshole in behind closed doors. I've heard he's the worst person on earth. But yeah, <laughs> the I'm worst not, person on earth. Who'd you hear that from? Uh, anyone who's ever worked with him. Oh, so you, you like, but personally, not just like on YouTube or whatever. No, I know some people that worked with him and they were like, yeah, he's a, he's a terrible person. Any, any good stories there? No, not that I, not, not personal stories. Have you had any, uh, bad reaction or bad, uh, interactions with, uh, stars, big stars? Uh, sure. Somewhat. Most of the time it's not even like, you know, I'm a lot of times I'm like doing a line or two. So they don't. But isn't that like worse because then they can they can kind of treat you like like kind of like Christian Bale yelling at the lighting guy like because right. he he's such a bigger star than that guy sure. like you can you know you you kind of have this power over over they have this power over you right I've worked on shows where the stars won't come out of their you know they're they're like bitching and moaning and you're like dude like they did and then I worked on I did NCIS Mark Harmon like literally the coolest dude on earth I worked with Clooney couldn't have been nicer. Like, like, you all of a sudden you see it, you go, I see why you're a movie star, dude. Coolest What'd you say, Jason? Anne Hathaway was super nice. Sue, that's awesome to hear, because I like her, too. Yeah, she's really hot. Yeah, she was, like, she, well, and, like, in between takes, like, she would, like, walk around and just talk to everybody. She was super yeah. nice. That's good to hear. I like hearing those stories. Yeah. How I Met Your Mother, uh, uh, super nice. Yeah, I mean, some of them are just. What about um, King of Queens? Were the did you get to like? Because every time I watch that show, I just I want to like hang out with those guys, like Kevin James and Pat Nalls. Like they just look like so much fun to hang out with. But I don't know yeah, if that's just on the fun. show. It's Do you what, you know somewhat professional? You know, it's it's not a party by any measure. Actually, the guys from Tacoma FD is a party. The oh, really? Guys. That does look fun it too. It might be the greatest set. I've been on and the new season premieres uh, Thursday night this week. Oh, that's season awesome. Premiere. I need to catch up yeah. on that. I watched one last night and I loved it. I, I saw that you're working with, um, what's this guy's name? Jimmy, Jimmy Tatro, I think is his name. He's, he's the, one of Tatro's the cops. In it. Tatro. Yeah, he was uh shock. He played shock. Yeah. He is blindingly funny. He's on home economics now, I think on. ABC. Yeah. He was, so he was on this show called American Vandal with, I had a yeah. guest. I don't know if you know Ryan O'Flanagan. He's a comedian. So I watched that. Um, to prep for my interview with him. And I saw this Jimmy guy and I was like, dude, this Jimmy guy, who is this guy? This kid's hilarious. Hilarious. And uh, I feel like he's like a, he's not a household name, but I feel like he could be. I, I worked with him on Tacoma FD. He was in the first episode I shot with him and I came home and I told my wife, I go, this kid's going to blow up. I, I thought he was one of the funniest people I'd been around in a long time. Oh, so even offset, like super funny. Yeah. Yeah, He's he's actually doing a ton of work. He's in home economics with Topher Grace. On, uh, but he's that's the thing man you know like i always i was always like the funniest guy in the room and then all of a sudden you go to work with people and you're like oh you know like dave keckner you're like you work with dave keckner you're like oh you can be that funny i had no idea humans could be that like there's just some people who you're like wow that wow that's super funny you know and those are the people who went who end up just blowing up right the, so yeah you guys had uh keckner on your show right on was it on the parents lounge or was that before you he did uh, he was another one 
with me. Our kids went to school together for a while. Just like shockingly funny guy. Just certain people are just so crazy funny. Yeah, I mean, Jason's Jason's worked with a bunch of people like that too. Where you're like, wow, isn't it crazy? When you you know you. That's why it's like you know you get to a point where you just feel lucky when you do work because not we're all so replaceable. Like you know, in the arts, it's like mm-hmm. you know, when you're an actor, it's I love when people are like. Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's like one of the greatest actors of all time, I think. Yes, died. I love him. And they just recast every project he had going like overnight. They don't. That's true. Yeah, know, I didn't think all, about it. You know, it's like I don't know anybody who's irreplaceable anymore. And you see people like I always think I'm super funny. And then I see other people like, oh, that guy's like the, the, uh, the Tacoma FD is just one of the every scene like you you had trouble keeping a straight face as you were shooting it was it was super fun but that's the other thing i think and and jason will probably back me up when you work on shows it's like it starts at the top whoever the ep and the star of the show is kind of dictates whether it's going to be a fun show or a crappy show you know however they go like when on ncis Mark Harmon just wouldn't stand for anyone being a jerk. He was the nicest guy on earth. And and if there was a rumor of somebody else being a bad person, he, he I, I, it's just, they dictate how the rest of the show goes. And, you know, I've been kind of lucky that most of the shows I've worked on have been just with people who are just class acts. And super it seems like, see, that's what's so interesting. I worked in education and I, I, I was always scared of like Hollywood and stuff and, and rock stars and everything. Cause I always thought they were all like prima donnas and they were all assholes. But the more I, I meet with them and talk to them, it's, it seems like the opposite. Cause they're all like really happy cause they're doing their dream job. Yeah. I don't think people tolerate it anymore. I think those are the days of old when you could be a dick and get away with it. And I think nowadays people just are fed up with it. They go, they're not going to put up with bad behavior anymore. And if you behave poorly on set, it gets around and then you don't get hired for the next job. Mm. Yeah, because the phones are there now, and people, as soon as that stuff starts, people are recording, and it just goes. I think that's not just in television or film. I think it's in life in general. Like, mm. you just can't get away with stuff anymore. Uh, you know. No, that's true. I mean, and some of that stuff is is good with like the Me Too and all this stuff. That's that's the good thing about that. Calling out some of these assholes that are just being pieces of shit, and uh, we're canceling them. And that that some of that cancel yeah. stuff is good if if people get canceled for if they're pieces of shit. Yeah, I mean, people who are like picking on Uber drivers or something where you're like, dude, you you know you're on camera, right? Yeah. Like, I know you're drunk and you're in the back of an Uber screaming at this guy, but you know he's filming you. Like, wherever you are, you're on camera. There's no two ways about it. So I don't know why people think they can get it. I had a, I was at a gas station recently. This is a crazy story. And I told, I've told this before on, on ours, but I, uh, I drove away. I was on the phone with my wife. I forgot I hadn't taken the pump out of the gas tank and I drove away and pulled the pump off of the gas thing. I pulled the whole pump and the oh. whole thing broke it. Oh, shit. Yeah, with my car. And so I had to go into the gas station and tell the guy. And I got I was like so embarrassed. I walked in. And he was like, oh, here's the clipboard. Like it, it, it gets done like once a day, apparently. Oh, but when shit. I walked really? Out, I didn't know there that. There was a cop filling his, filling his car who I hadn't seen. He goes... He goes, actually, I thought you were going to drive away. And I was talking to the cop and I was like, do people drive away anymore? I'm obviously on camera yeah, everywhere. Every surveillance camera everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. And wow. he's like, well, people still drive away. I go, well, people are, people are stupid. It's the same with cops. They know they're being, they have like chest cams on and still they. Oh, <laughs> I heard a joke. Uh, I think it was Fahim. Do you, do you know Fahim Anwar? Do you, do you know a lot of the LA comics at all? I know, I know who Fahim is. Yeah, sure. yeah, he's a, like he's got some joke about how like the the <laughs> technology has changed so much, but police body cams like still malfunction more than they should, or something. Like yeah, that. that's actually really funny. Yeah. That's pretty funny. Oh, it, didn't, it didn't turn on. Yeah, he's like, I don't know, the the body cam didn't work for some reason. <laughs> you can hear you this know, person Mason getting beat. Had another job where uh, you should were you were body cam for a while doing your crazy job, weren't you, Jason? Yeah, so my normal everyday job is still shut down until, you know, the moratoriums for eviction are done. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a process server for the Supreme Court. And so wow. I have to wear a body cam because people will lie and tell, say, we didn't get, we didn't, we, you didn't, he didn't serve us. Or they'll tell, like, well, one guy said I slapped his wife. <laughs> and then, and like, obviously, I've never hit a woman at all because. I'm smaller than them. I look like a giant baby. <laughs> and so, like, they, they, uh, they gave, they, um, they pulled my body cam footage and they're like, he clearly didn't slap your wife. Duh. 
And then another time I had somebody say I broke into their house and the camera showed from the time I went until the time I left, I, I never even opened like their porch door, let it, let alone like walk in their house. So is it like that movie pineapple? Is it pineapple express is the one where he's the process server and he has to wear all the disguises. Do you do that? that uh, I have, I have been a pizza delivery guy more times than I'd like, <laughs> I care to admit. <laughs> That's and hilarious. Now, so you say you I, pretend that you're I delivering walk. a pizza, and then you say you've been served, bitch. Well, you probably don't say I, bitch. I, so I, I I got pizza boxes from a local pizza shop that were clean because I can't have a greasy a greasy okay. summons. And I put okay. the papers inside, and I said, "Hey, is John Charles here?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, yeah. Is that pizza for you?" I'm like. This is for you. And they open it up because it's obviously too light. And there's some instances in there, but I've already... As soon as they see it, Wait, true. they don't realize they didn't order. They're like, oh, somebody did a good deed and they ordered me a pizza. Like, because they obviously didn't order the pizza. People stop functioning properly when free food hits the brain. It's uh, it's uh... It just shows how bad of a person he was in the first place that he would obviously take somebody else's pizza. So he got yeah, what he deserved. It's somebody it. else's pizza. That's you're right. Yeah. What a piece they of They always shit. do that when they uh they have a you know, when they do a roundup for a bunch of criminals, they go uh they send out emails that oh, say, yeah. Hey, you won two tickets to see oh, the Dodgers. Really? Is that what they do? It. Oh yeah. Interesting. Uh you won the lottery. They've told people they won the lottery and uh they'll show up, you know, with their kids unfortunately, and then they get arrested and they, they get to call home and go, hey, come pick up the kids because I can't I can't drive the kid home. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's that's crazy. crazy dude. This is good, good uh, to I know. I can't believe, Jason, you didn't dress up as Iron Man. Well, I, 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 the costume is hard to run in and sometimes I've been attacked, so I would like, if I fall over, I'm not getting back on by the way. Wait, you can't fly in that costume? It's an Iron Man costume. You can't fly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to... I'm an engineer, but not that good of an engineer. Oh, oh. Jesus. You're not Tony Stark then, man. Yeah. It'd be funny if you showed up to serve and you were like, they're like, what are you doing? You go, oh, I'm here for the kid's birthday party. Oh, and this is for you. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. That'd be a good one for a birthday party for kid's birthday. Right on. I have served, I had to serve during, I came during a family reunion once and the people were all out there and then I had to find the one guy and they're all like, it's him, it's him. And like, I have to walk through this family who clearly did not like that I was there, but you never know if you're going to find them again. You just have to give it to them when it's time. Oh, that sounds like a you, horrible job. Do you tell people where you are at all times? Because I can imagine the family would be like, why don't we just kill him and bury him in the yard and then no one will know. So, so when I'm working, my phone has an app on it that logs exactly where my I am. That sounds like a dangerous so job. Get, it, it does sound it like is, a horrible I've, job. I have been, I have had a gun pulled on me four times and I was attacked by a turkey once. Wait, so why can't, so are you not doing like the, the paranormal stuff anymore? No, I still do. Oh, that's I just have, more uh, of a I side a, job or something? A, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, sometimes it's, it's like, there's space in between them and we i mean we obviously have bills to pay so mm. in between the paranormal stuff like if there's a lull particularly in like the winter time um but like from like spring to october when halloween is paranormal is all over but from like november through april there's a lull so oh, okay um hmm. i do have um i have a there's two i have uh, I'm gonna be in um, a documentary that's coming out from uh, the crew over at Planet Weird that um, they, they has Hellier, their show Hellier that I did. Um, they're gonna be uh, the new documentary about a haunted artifact is coming out uh, this fall. Okay, well that's cool. And then so yeah, we got to talk about your podcast, obviously. So again, it was like you each had your own dad podcast, and then you combined it into the Parents Lounge. So tell tell us tell them tell my audience about the, the I listened to a couple episodes. There it is. The, the got the logo if you're watching on YouTube. Yeah. Well, it's it's uh Jason you take it. We it's Misery Loves Company and obviously <laughs> we were we were fighting through it and so uh we we joined forces. Um yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, our buddy Dave Schrader from uh The Holzer Files and the new uh Lizzie Borden uh show on Discovery Plus. Um he I was doing my dadpocalypse show and he's like, Hey, you know, who you need to have on your show. 
Jamie Kaler because he's also he also does a dad podcast too. And I had known Jamie from you know some of the paranormal stuff he had done. Uh, and and when he came on my show, we just clicked. I mean, there's a I mean, you, if you've seen the show, there's a back and forth. It's super. Oh, I'm seeing fun. it right here. I'm seeing and you guys have back were, and forth. And we, you know, we just we just clicked on that level and. After the show was done, we're like, that was super fun. I was like, you should come back next week. And then three weeks later, we're like, why? We should combine these into our, and, and the Parents Lounge was born. Is, did and that we help? Still we still haven't met in person. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we've never, we've never met in real life. As far as I know, he's a 67-year-old Vietnamese woman. I don't actually know. <laughs> does that help your numbers when you guys combine? Does it, does it help the podcast grow? Like, you bring all the fans from... From each... I mean, it does at the beginning because mm -hmm. they merge a little bit. Yeah. But it, then you're on your own. You know, you're still, you know, trying to cut through the fog. As I'm sure you know, it's so funny because, you know, we've got our hardcore fans who just come for the parenting stuff. And then, like anything else, the shows that are celebrity driven, you know, push numbers. Like right. We've had, we've had some good, you know, it's kind of crappy to a degree because he and I, I mean, I don't know how you feel about it, but at a certain point, it's like, I just love riffing about the day's events, but you know, you really got a book. It's about booking guests. And how do you get those? Cause you had like Larry, the cable guy and you had David uh, Ketchner. Like, how do you know these? Is this just from your connections from working? Yeah, it's all from shows I've worked on and, and Jason's brought, you know, that's how we got Belanger in there. And we got a bunch of, it's just from our work and, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I have been in Hollywood for like 25 years working on different shows and stuff. So I've, I kind of have uh, people that I've reached out to, to come and, and, and they want to, because the thing about being a parent is that you want to tell people the crazy, like you're, you're like, like most stories start with, you're not going to believe what my kid did this morning. That's every story that people tell on our show. And you're like, no, no, we're all going to believe it because it's all happened to us. And that was what the purpose of it was because we all think we're, going through this thing by ourself and and uh but the truth is whatever we are living through right now somebody already lived through it it's already happened to almost everybody and you're like oh yeah that's what kids do that's what they do yeah mm -hmm. yeah, well, yeah I like literally right now i had to come to the playground and put take send my wife with the children to the playground so i could have the quiet during the daytime to yeah. do this interview yeah yeah, I think uh, for me, again, I'm not a parent yet, but I feel like if I ever do have kids, I feel like I'm going to be the best father because I've seen from so many other people like what what to do and what, like what works, but also so many people make mistakes, and I I learn from other people's mistakes. I see how they raise their kid, and I go, oh, that's that's the bad way to parent. You guys must wait, see that wait, too. Wait, so right? back up. I can you can you tell us the rules because honestly, I'm I'm still searching for how to do this because well, I think it's a bad. No idea. I still, let's, let's let Chuck tell us how to parent. Why don't they, I want to hear what he has to say. I no, I you learn. I'm just saying, like, what I'm saying, like, what I learned not to do. I think it's a balancing act, right? Like, because you see the parents that are like, they're helicopter parents, right? And they're just like all in their kids' business. And then you see the parents that are just totally lax and let their kids, uh, you know, run wild. You got to be somewhere in the middle, I think. Personally, that's just what I is it, with teenagers especially. I don't know about with little kids. It's probably a little bit different. You kind of have to be a helicopter parent when they're obviously when they're two years old. But with like when they get a little older, yeah, like they're trying to kill themselves. Yeah, you kind of have to be that. But I think as they get older, I think you kind of have to find that balance. And I'm not. I don't know exactly where it is. I just know that's the, the extremes. Art, yeah, that's like what you just said was like explaining Carl Walenda. You know, Jamie, there's a wire between these two buildings. And I think when you, if you, the easy way to do it is just as you go across, just try to find the balance between the two. <laughs> it's that simple. Just right, find the balance right, right. on it. But it's, yes, exactly right. But the balance is, honestly, it it moves. The the the, the goalposts well, move every day. Yeah, and I think the thing is, too, but is like... Not only does the goalpost move, but occasionally, like a four hundred pound gorilla will drop down on top of yeah. your your tightrope. Yeah. Or uh, suddenly the tightrope will catch on fire. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of this other crazy stuff. Well, that and happens. I, the other thing is too is I think obviously you got to take into account individual differences. Every kid is totally different. Like I mean, you could get a kid who's like totally obedient and plays by the rules, and then but more often than not, you're getting a kid who's going to be more. Uh, you know, misbehaving, and then you got to deal with that. So that's obviously going to be a throw well, a big my wrench. My twins started as the same egg. I mean, they were the same. They were a person, and then they blap two two kids, and they could not be more different. Like they just 
they are not like other than looking alike, they are not the same in any way. Well, not they just that, but the, the one of the kids, the kid will be super. Um, you're like, oh, okay, we have this duked in. Like one day she's, oh, she's good. She's being a good girl. Then the next day, no. So it, to say, you know, some kids are like this. They're all like that at different times. And then the second you think you have one age group figured out, they jump to the next age group and then they're totally dickish in their own new way. Mm-hmm. My daughter and I, we have conversations every day. I'm like, look, you're making my life hard, man. What are you doing? You're making my life hard. She's like last night, we had such a, we go to this barbecue, whatever, and it's going great. Everybody's being cool. And then the people at the barbecue, it's like eight o'clock at night. It's a school night. I'm like, we got to go. And just as we're leaving, she breaks out the ice cream for the other for her kids, and I'm and my daughter sees the ice cream. It's like I want ice cream, so I'm I have to carry her out over my shoulder. She's kicking and punching me and screaming because she, she wants ice cream, and I'm like I'm not letting you have ice cream at eight o'clock on a Sunday night. It's not happening. And I'm like literally, it's like I caught a hyena trying to get her into the car, and I you know I put her down at the car, and she started running back to the house, and I was like. What the fuck? <laughs> You're not three. You, you like yeah. she just was like, oh, I'm getting ice cream, and I was like, "You're not getting ice cream." Ice cream I, is I like crack to kids. Yeah, you know, smashed her into the car. Yeah, no, but I, I think I, I, you guys have some good advice. You, you obviously know more than me about parenting, but um, I heard uh, we know we don't know anything more than you. Well, no, we, no, no. Like, it's like we went to Vietnam and we, you know, I, I can say, yeah, I was there. I got shot at, but I don't, I don't know anything about it. I mean, we're both still alive, but that's just, that's it. I mean, we have managed to live this long. And that's, if you as a parent can live this, survive them, and they don't go to jail, you're doing your job. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's the best, no. that's, that's the best you can do. Right, the but best. no. Jason, I heard you talking about some, some advice that you had. Good advice. Like you said, uh, laughter is important. You know, making the kids laugh, laughing with them, laughing together, which is obviously easy for you guys to do. Well, we're doing a show uh, in two weeks. And honestly, I just wrote a big post because my album comes out this Friday that I'm sure you will help promote. But I yes. Uh, so I wrote a little post and the post was about because the whole album is about the pandemic. OK, the fact that it's called homeschool. I, I homeschooled my kids for like 18 months, like. Which is not what you want to be doing at, at 56 years old. But it, it was what it was. And it was super painful, like super painful. And I, I wrote in the post, I said, I was really proud of myself because I've always had the skill to laugh at adversity. And that honestly, I think that's where Jason and I really connect the most. The fact that, you know, listen, my wife sometimes like she bitches and moans about stuff. And I go, yeah, I mean, what are you going to do? You got to laugh at it because otherwise, how would you get through this insanity? Because, I mean, we, we complain about all these crazy things, but then you see, you know, there's a, there's a kid at my school that has cancer. You see somebody else has this horrible tragedy. And at the end of the day, my wife will lose her mind and I'll be like, hey, the kids are healthy. We're not bankrupt. You know, there's bigger, there's bigger things to worry about. So, you know, I, I bitch and moan, but I always like my wife bitches and moans. And I said, if you're going to do it, you got to do it in a comedic way. If you can do it funny, it's one thing. But if you're just going to be bitching and moaning, then it's it's awful. So you have to find the humor in everything because it's tragedy plus time, man. That's how it works. And mm-hmm. so, uh, yeah. So that's every week we end up telling insane stories about parenting that yeah. turn out to be pretty funny. Yeah, and I think it's entertaining even if you're not a parent. I, I still found it funny. So that's great. So Parents Lounge, the new uh, comedy album is called Homeschooled. Uh, Jason, sorry, what was the thing you, you, you said you have something coming out too? What's it called? Yeah, they haven't announced the name of it, but okay. if you keep watching uh, the folks over at uh, Planet Weird, uh, the Museum for the Paranormal, the Newkirks, um, they are going to announce very soon when this this new documentary that's paranormal-based is coming out. Okay. Anything else you guys want to promote? Well, uh, we have a live show coming up, um, our very first live show. Oh. Jamie and I will finally be meeting in person. Uh, Sayre, Pennsylvania at the Sayre Theater, September 24th and 25th. Uh, 7 p.m. Uh, uh, Jamie and I are going to take to the stage uh, with the Parents Lounge live stand-up comedy show. Okay, sweet. And then do you guys have a charity that you want to give a shout-out to here at the end? Jason, you going? I mean, I'm a big, I, I'm a, I'm a veteran, so I'm always into veteran charities, especially nowadays when they, uh, they deserve uh, all our help. But um, I, I don't have a very specific one. 
I've, I've worked I with like a lot. Me. Wounded Warriors, like I've worked me. with a lot. Wounded Warriors, yeah, I've had promoted that many times on the show. I'll, I'll put that in yeah. the notes along with your guys's. Uh, do you have a you have a website, right? I think, or should I just? Uh, we do, but most people find us on Facebook. Okay. On the, at the Parents Lounge. Um, and it's everywhere. It's you on YouTube, Google, Spotify, names, Apple. Jamie Kaler yeah. and Jason Gowan. Uh, it'll pop up. And they, they can follow you on social media and all that good stuff. So YouTube, yeah. uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitch, iTunes. Yeah, all that stuff. ITunes. Great. Yep. Awesome. So well, find us and let us know what you think. Okay. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, you can. We'll say goodbye to the audience. Goodbye, audience. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. All right. I want to make sure I thank Jamie Kaler and Jason Gowan. Uh, thank you so much for doing my show. And again, their podcast is called The Parents Lounge. So check that out and uh, follow them on social media to keep up with their other projects. Uh, again, Jamie has a, uh, a comedy album coming out called Homeschooled. Uh, you can follow them on social media, follow their YouTube, all that good stuff. You can also do the same for me. You can follow me on social media, subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm really pushing that one right now. Uh, write me a review of my podcast. And again, I'll, I'll read it on air like I did at the beginning of this one. And I'll give you a shout out. That's for a limited time only. I can't, I don't know if I can do that forever, but uh, at least right now while I'm waiting to get some reviews. I will uh, go ahead and read yours on air. So that's kind of fun. Uh, you know, sometimes with this podcasting business, you just, you feel like you want to quit, but you know, then you have an episode like this and I just had a lot of fun with these guys. Most fun I've had doing podcasting in a while. So again, I want to give a special thanks to them. Make sure to follow them, check out all their stuff. Thank you so much for listening and taking the time with this podcast. Have a great rest of your day and remember to shoot for the moon.